porous, which is 245T and 24D, 245 or 24. DDT uh, had recently been banned, and in happened a coalition of member groups rallied people to take action on Forest Spring and, br and brought the issue of pesticides front and center. We took legal steps and we gained important wins. And these early uh, and foundation building years are an important part of our legacy. The champions you are about to meet on our panel are heroes. We cannot thank them enough for the sacrifices they each made, the hours given, the sleepless nights, the research, the strategizing meetings, and the fighting of the good fight. Their voices and stories inform us, inspire us, and shine light on how to proceed. And we thank you. ways to use litigation in line to win and to set strong legal precedents. An example of this can be found in our current programs. In, in 2008, after many years, we had a number of organophosphate family pesticides. There was a, uh, on yesterday, we had a panel all about and policy change. We are working to reduce urban pesticide use in schools, parks, uh, housing, and other public places. We are pushing EPA to improve their pesticide monitoring and alternatives assessment. And we are pushing for federal reforms in both pesticide and agriculture laws, including um, in USDA, we're working on to green up the farm bill and reduce pesticide use through uh, incentives for farmers to change their um, practices. At EPA, we're working on FIFRA reforms, all again aim to advance alternatives and reduce pesticide use, not only in the Northwest, but at the national level. So now I would like to also welcome my co-moderator, Norma Greer, who many of you know as our longtime executive director. She directed uh, NCAP for 25 years? Something. Something. <laughs> and she is definitely a mentor and a very good friend to me, and I'm so honored to be now uh, working at, uh, as executive director of NCAP. So, I turn it over to you, Norma, to introduce our panel. Thank you. Here, Kim. Kim. Oh, yes, thank you. Great. So I'm Norma Greer, and I what we're going to be talking about today is the toxic trials, and they truly are a legacy. Um, in 1984, NCAP won a National Environmental Policy Act lawsuit that stopped all herbicide applications on uh, federal forest lands in Oregon and Washington. And I'm, NEPA, as some of you may know, is sort of a procedural act. You have to follow certain procedures, and once those procedures are followed, actions can proceed. But we, it's been almost, tw it's been 28 years since that ruling came down in 1984. And I have to say, BLM is still enjoined from spraying young forest trees. <laughs> and that's an amazing legacy for a procedural act. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of things that have happened since then. But in the 1970s, sort of leading up to the lawsuit that NCAP, was in, that NCAP took on, there was cutting on federal forest lands that was just going gangbusters. Um, the private forest lands had already been cut over, and where the standing timber was was on federal forest lands. The public forest lands were constrained to only cutting the amount of timber that could be um, grown again on those sites. It was a sustainable yield. And there was an allowable cut on an annual basis that couldn't be greater than the amount that was cut in that year. And so the timber industry and its great greedy interests figured out that if they could argue for um, practices that encourage trees to grow faster, they could get the same volume of tr um, timber on uh, acre of land in a 60-year period or a 80-year period instead of a 100-year period. And that allowed for a greater harvest of trees. Um, and the 
forest spraying was one of those practices that they argued um, accelerated timber growth. And um, so it was the number of logs coming off of forest lands that really drove the interest in spraying. Um, the, uh, in the 1970s and early 80s, literally tens of thousands of acres were sprayed annually on federal forest lands. So it, it had a huge impact on residents and the forested watersheds throughout the Northwest, and actually across the country. <laughs> um, there was an amazing network of activists working on things. Those were feisty times. We had a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> and uh, there was a lot of sharing of information, uh, sharing of strategies, direct action tactics. Um, and we could not put everyone on the panel that really contributed to this effort. Um, so you get a selection today. But I, I just want to honor all the people that made up that network of activists um, and scientists and attorneys that brought us to where we are today. Um, some of those folks are no longer alive, and we owe all of them, all of you, uh, a, our gratitude for what you brought. Um, so in 1983, NCAP uh, agreed to take on a lawsuit against the U.S. Forest Service and the BLM, and we were as a regional organization, we had an ability to expand the voice of the, and the, the victories that had been won by three of the groups that brought lawsuits. Um, CATS had brought a lawsuit that set um, the Citizens Against Toxic Sprays in the Coast Range. That was a huge uh, precedent that was set. Southern Oregon Citizens Against Toxic Sprays uh, won a lawsuit, Save Our Ecosystems piggybacked on that and brought an injunction against Eugene BLM and uh, Paul Merrill, uh, before he got his license to practice law, represented himself and, <laughs> and some of the residents of the Coast Range, their interests in, in winning a lawsuit. So um, it was a terrific victory that we had in 1984. Um, it hugely uh, changed how, I mean, it, it brought, it curbed spraying on federal forest lands. But by the late 1980s, another effort by activists really changed the landscape. And that's really the spotted owl activists. Because spraying follows clear cuts. <laughs> and when the timber harvesting was curved. Um, we really didn't see as much spraying. And on federal lands, we're not seeing as much spraying. Um, and a lot of the spraying has shifted back onto private lands. So it hasn't quite gone away. <laughs> but you'll hear more of the story um, today about uh, how we got how these amazing, uh, well, you'll hear some amazing stories. There you go. <laughs> we have four panelists, and we gave them some questions that we asked them to ponder as they prepared their presentations. So I'm going to read those questions to you. I'm going to ask the audience to hold your questions until all the panelists have spoken. They have 10 minutes each. And um, the questions we asked them were, what do you think was gained through victories in the forest spray cases? What was most successful? Second was what was especially challenging about that work? Were there elements of that, the elements of what NCAP and other parties did that were unsuccessful? Three, can or did the legal victories in forestry cases inform other pesticide-related suits, like spraying in other public areas or pesticide personal injury towards, et cetera? And how, how did that happen? And four, how is the current legal or regulatory climate different from what it was in the 1980s? How does that impact a legal approach to pesticide reform? So those were some of the questions we posed to the panelists. 
Um, I am going to ask Carol Van Strum to start off the panel. Um, and Carol is a, a longtime resident of the Oregon Coast Range, where uh, a lot of these issues, the genesis of these issues, uh, can be traced to the Oregon Coast Range and the smart people that live and live there now. <laughs> um, Carol is the author of a wonderful book that chronicles the, what was happening in the 70s and 80s, A Bitter Far, Herbicides and Human Rights, published by Sierra Club Books. Um, it's no longer in print, but you can find it in a lot of libraries, especially here in Oregon. Carol Menstrom. Yeah. After that introduction. <laughs> you left out one thing. Oh, how much fun we had. Oh, causing trouble. <laughs> well, because even when things really are kind of bleak to know that you've caused some bureaucrat a night of no sleep can really be encouraging. <laughs> so I, I think there, the element of troublemaking should always be included. In it. <clears throat> the case that you mentioned that we began in the Coast Range was called Cats v. Berglund and Citizens Against Toxic Sprays, which was a name <laughs> that was reached in about five minutes in order to bring a lawsuit. You have to have a name, and we didn't have a name. So, um, that's why it's kind of a strange name. But um, when we moved there in 1974 to Five Rivers, the following spring, there were helicopters spraying everywhere. There were road department trucks coming through and with massive hoses spraying everything in sight. And no, oh, the, we'd ask neighbors and other people, what are they doing? And no one knew. One woman said, oh, I think they're spraying for mosquitoes. And like nobody even knew. No one was told what was going on. And that was kind of the beginning. Because right after they sprayed the bridges right around our place, and this truck went through our property, spraying on both sides of the road, a bunch of our animals but well, some of them died, and chicks and the things were long to form, feed on that when their beaks crossed their bars. And my children got very sick. And it was soon after that, and here's another trigger, is I don't like people lying to me. I just have a problem with it. And there was an article in our local county paper by a gentleman that some of you will remember named Michael Newton, who called himself the forest pediatrician at OSU and was a, uh, what we call the first class nozzle head. He, he lived and breathed pesticides. He just loved them and would never consider the possibility of them doing any harm. And he wrote this article about this wonderful spray program and how it was going to make the trees grow faster and it was totally harmless. And I read that and he, I didn't know who he was, but I figured he'd just never been out there if he thought it was so harmless. And so I wrote a letter to the editor saying what happened on our farm after they sprayed. I just said, excuse me, they're not that harmless. And it was shortly after that that some of the people in Five Rivers contacted us ended up having a meeting and people from Deadwood came over and that's how Cats was born. We were so naive we thought all we have to do is tell the Forest Service that these bad things are happening and they'll stop. Well they didn't. They didn't want to listen to us and at that point we realized we either put up with it and suffer or we have to find some legal way to stop them because None of us were that good a shot. <laughs> so we went, sent a delegation to Eugene, and the one lawyer in all of Eugene that would listen to us was Bruce Anderson. And um, 
he said, you know, there's no way you can afford to fight this. But if you do all the work, he would give us as reduced a rate as he could. And so we were doing bank sales, we were doing all the usual things to pay him. But we did all the research for that case. And none of us had ever done anything like it before. I mean, the closest we had was John Well, who had a couple of PhDs. And all these people got together and did what was needed to put that case together. And it was amazing. Um, I don't even know how to explain how extraordinary it was that people who never met each other before could get so much done. Um, that was the beginning of the Katz case, which we won, again, on a NEPA case, because the Forest Service had not adequately considered the effects of our spray. And that was the beginning of the battle against herbicides in Oregon. I don't think there had been any cases before that except Billy Shoecraft's case in uh, Arizona, and um, she actually died before that case ever was resolved, and I think it was finally just settled. But, um, yeah, she was one of the few that had dared to even question what was going on. And since then, uh, a lot more has been discovered because we went ahead and participated in the um, cancellation proceedings against 245T and Sindex. And um, upon which EPA based its final ban of those chemicals was the ALSI study, which was a study of miscarriages in Western Oregon, showing an enormous spike in what they call spontaneous abortions, and we call involuntary ones, um, right after they sprayed. What and was, the other basis, what was the substance that they it was 245T and Silvex, which was a variant of 245T. Um, 245T was half of Angel Orange. The other half was 24D, which is still, still the being spread. Mm -hmm. um, another scandal. I mean, I could talk for hours on scandals, but anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, the other half, I'm just mentioning this, of EPA's basis for banning those chemicals was a three generation rat study that Dow Chemical did and claimed there were no effects. But when the EPA scientists looked at the data, they said, wait a minute, there's increasing effects from one generation to the next. And there was a lot of controversy over it. It all got buried and swept under the rug when Dow finally withdrew from that registration and nothing ever came of it. But just today, a study came out. I read it before I left this morning. The, the U.S. Army commissioned University of Washington to do, and guess what? All these chemicals, like herbicides and dioxins and a few other things, cause multi-generational effects in humans. It's like, <laughs> it only took 30 years <laughs> for it to come back up again. But anyway, that the silencing of a lot of that information has been another scandal, I think. And I don't know what more you want to hear about. Something came out today, you were starting to say a study that came out today. Yes, it was from the University of Washington. I have an article about it in my bag. If you want, I can find it. Um, but it was finding multi-generational effects. That was today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from a number of pesticides, a whole range of pesticides, dioxins, I can't remember. Is this a grass study again? As well? Pardon? Is this a rat study or a human study? It was a human study, I believe. We'll have more, uh, we'll also have more time. We're, we're um, really trying to give all the panelists a, a good amount of time to speak and share their stories. And thank you, Carol. And we'll have more time for questions. We are hoping to have 20 or 25 minutes for questions at the end. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So I next, thank you, Carol. I next want to introduce um, 
Mary O'Brien. I had the pleasure of working many years at NCAP with Mary. And um, Mary really got into the stuff. <laughs> and um, was has done a lot of thinking about the NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, and how it can impact our behavior as a society. Um, some, the result of some of that thinking is put in her book about um, alternatives assessment called Making Better Environmental Decisions an Alternative to Risk Assessment. And um, the groundwork for really a lot of the uh, threads that run through that book were part of the toxic trials that we're talking about today. So Mary O'Brien. And, you know, I've, ha I've passed this out to a lot of people, but some people came in since then. If you raise your hand, could Norma get one to, oh. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that is, is that the same thing I have? No, there's a one piece of yeah. Okay. Good. There aren't that many of them, so. Because I'm going to be talking about two provisions in uh, the National Environmental Policy Act. Is there anyone who's not familiar with NEPA and, and its regulations? Um, as you know, it's a law that is required uh, that all federal agencies, if they are undertaking a project that might have significant uh, human health or ecological environmental impacts, need to do an analysis of the degree of the impacts and, and in the case of um, environmental assessments and especially environmental impact statements look at alternatives. So Norm is absolutely right that the, these um, toxic trials um, set a path for uh, thinking about this part. Um, the first one is the worst case analysis and you'll see that uh, section 1502.22, which is the first one, was the original worst case analysis provision. It is the only provision that has been changed in the Council of Environmental Qualities National Environmental Policy Act regulations since 1970 when they were published. And it was changed because of the toxic trials. The current section 1502.22, which replaced it, is below that on the paper. And, and the, the reason the Justice Department became so exercised about worst case analysis provision was because, as Ruth Shear showed clearly in the trials, the Federal Aid, Forest Service and BLM were saying that 24D was safe. By the time we were in um, the, the trial, it, um, the NCAP trial, it was 24D that was still being used, not 245T. Thanks, Carol. Frank Dost and Jim Witt and Mike Newton at Oregon State University had been the toxicologists for the Forest Service, and they said 24D was safe, and the Forest Service and the BLM believed them, and it wasn't true. The fact was 24D associated with peripheral neuropathy, but also critical to the case, as, as Ruth so eloquently explained, it was associated with cancer. So case after case went against the Forest Service and BLM because of this one provision. They kept saying it was safe, and it wasn't. They hadn't explained the worst case that could happen if they sprayed it, which was that people would die of cancer. <laughs> So what the worst case analysis provision did was effectively challenge the paradigm of risk assessment. That manipulative process by which numerical assumption after numerical assumption is piled on top of each other until the risk simply, sim simply seems improbable. And the explanation so convoluted that if you try to pick it apart, you get accused of nitpicking. One particular um, lawyer in the Justice Department and the Justice Department back in D.C. became incensed about the results of these cases and began a campaign to eliminate the worst case analysis provision completely, as well as the requirement that low probability risks be discussed in environmental assessments. 
underneath them. Interestingly, and this was going swimmingly for the, Wash the Justice Department, until, interestingly, Northern, Northern Arizona University decided on their own to invite the different players in this debate to a weekend at Northern Arizona University to discuss the worst case analysis provision. And lo and behold, at that debate, it became clear to the astonishment of the Justice Department that no one thought this was such a big deal. Even the timber industry could live with the worst case analysis provision. This was a case of the Justice Department in a bubble in D.C. thinking this was impossible and it made any activity by the federal agencies impossible. So what you got was actually not a deletion entirely of the worst case analysis provision, but instead this new version, which is much more wordy, less clear, um, and probably <coughs> less utilized by environmental organizations than it should be and I, I'll let you read the, the details on that. But back to the herbicide cases being one, largely due to worst case analysis. When the final Ninth Circuit Court opinion came down, upholding the forbidding of all of Region 6 Forest Service, which is Washington, Oregon, and Oregon BLM from using herbicides, the, um, the Forest Service in, in Portland the regional office called NCAP and said, what do we do to not see you in court again? <laughs> and we said, come down to the NCAP offices and for one day and bring your top management. And when they came down, they, of course they were expecting to, you know, listen to a rant from us in our, our, our funky little office. Instead, we had brought district rangers and silviculturists from the Forest Service who had been not using herbicides and successfully reforesting. And they were astonished to find that these, these on-the-ground Forest Service people had been flying under the radar of the, of the regional office doing just fine, thank you, because they didn't want to face the wrath of people like Carol Van Strom, and had been doing well. So then we said, the other thing you need to do is not go to Jim Witt, Frank Ghost, and Mike Newton for your toxicology in the next DI in, in environmental impact statement. You go to someone else, but not to that toxicology department because they never saw an herbicide you couldn't drink. The third one was work with us, and this is important for this last um, CEQ regulation 1502.14 that I've written out there, work with NCAP to write a least herbicide alternative for the next EIS. That doesn't mean you have to adopt the least herbicide alternative, but you have to work with us to write one that's reasonable and isn't set up to fail because we know, we believe we know how you can grow trees using much less herbicides and they agreed to do that. And for the next 18 months, we relied on tree planters who had observed that red alder left on a site was better than being herbicide because it fixes nitrogen. With district rangers and forest silviculturists who had learned to plant two-year-old trees rather than vulnerable little, little um, seed leaves. And when we finally wrote the um, least herbicide alternative, it about 90% of it was adopted in the final EIS. And that's one of the really positive things that came out of this, because it wasn't just no, it was how do you do things better and with less environmental impact? And for me, that changed my life, because for the last 25 years, I have worked almost nonstop with the, with the alternatives provision in NEPA, which says you need to consider all reasonable alternatives. And so I have constantly worked with, in all of my environmental work, um, putting in alternatives for NEPA projects in the scoping period. And when I say I, it's always a whole crew of people working together. Um, and in every case, although it hasn't been a simple case of them being adopted 90% um, intact, but in every case, it has made a difference. It has put us at the table with the Forest Service. 
or with the other agencies we were working with, it has um, brought them to the realization they really could do things differently than they have. And it's a lot of hard work. And like 1502.22, the new version, I don't think it's been used enough by conservation organizations to get in at the scoping period of a, an EA or an environmental impact statement and put in a complete comprehensive alternative. Because the wonderful thing is, that law doesn't say those alternatives only have to have been written by the agency. So that was um, one of the stories out of the talks and trials. The government was early broadcast spraying these chemicals because they thought it would kill the broadleaf competing vegetation and allow the conifers to be released from the soil. But they were also spraying all the people who were in the forest. And they were also spraying the people who came in after the spraying and, and worked in the forest. And these chemicals, many of them were fat soluble and they could be inhaled. And if you ate, they could be ingested. And they were taken from all sorts of ways. The mindset of these people, if I had to think of an anecdote of the mindset of the people who were doing the spraying, and I tried to think of one and I thought of it this minute. I was one time down in Roseburg because the, the spotted owl was being used in litigation as a marker species because we're trying to preserve the habitat for the owls was important. So we wanted to show that the owls were being poisoned by these chemicals. And uh, we came up with a dead owl that had probably been poisoned. And we took it and gave it to uh, the people we told were the appropriate people to do a necropsy on this, what was the meat crop is already dead, to evaluate this owl and to measure the herbicides. And we couldn't get an answer on whether or not the probability was that the herbicides had killed the owl. And we kept asking, we kept asking. And then finally, I went down to the Roseburg Forest Service, or one of the Forest Service, and just to see the person I, knew I couldn't get the answer from. And I kept waiting for him and waiting for him. I said, well, this and I went back into his office and I knocked on his door and I opened the door. He didn't open the door and he's sitting there and I said, I'm Larry Sokol. I'm the guy I've been talking to you. I want to know what happened to our owl results. And as I said it, I looked over my left shoulder and up on his desk was a stuffed owl. And that owl looked very familiar. And I said, uh, Is that our owl? 
and uh, he sort of uh, kind of tried to nod at me, and uh, I said, that's our owl. What are the results? Uh, there were no results. Uh, that is the mindset of the opponents that uh, we saw. So when this litigation started, and Bruce did all the superb work, and I got uh, brought in, and then, because uh, they like to talk, and then they would court a lot, and then I brought in the brains, Mike Axline, and first I brought in Bonine, and then Axline, and then a lot of the rest of the time was spent fighting amongst the three of us as to who would be able to talk in court. Mm -hmm. The three not very small egos fighting among <laughs> ourselves. Not very easy to divide up the work, but we tried to divide up the work, and uh, you know, we, it wasn't easy. So all along, while this litigation is going on, and these people are doing all the science and giving us all the information, and uh, John's giving us the law, and Mike's giving us the law, and, and we're in front of these conservative, one conservative judge after another, but fine judges, fine judges, first Judge Scopel, then Judge Redden, and we are going after the government uh, to, to, to show that these chemicals are poisonous and that the risk assessments that are being done at exactly as Mary has explained, they are, they are reducing the risks to none. And I remember at one point in the hallway seeing Mike Newton and I said, well, I shouldn't swear because we're on tape. I said, I don't give a blank if you uh, tell other people to do this. As far as I'm concerned, you can give yourself a dioxin enema, but I don't want you giving it to other people. And uh, so if you invited me to dinner, <laughs> anyway, uh, we've not been, we were not friends. <laughs> this, litigation, this litigation went on, and uh, because of Bruce's superb work, the injunction was entered initially by Judge Scopel, and then it was continued, and then eventually there was a cancellation of the registration of the chemical, and as has been properly said, they're not early broadcast spraying these chemicals anymore, and, and you can see the change in the course of the country, and you can thank the people who are sitting up here and a few others, because it's the truth. They did this. And so what I wanted to say to you was that I don't know almost any except my close friend Carl and Karen and their children here, and the people that I actually literally have not seen for at least 25 years, um, that, that you have, all of you have, the same ability in one way or another to make an actual change as you're looking back in your life, Mary O'Brien will be able to look back on her life and see I did this and I did this and I did this. And, and Dr. Shearer will be able to look back on her life and say, you know, I didn't charge these people, I volunteered my time. I gave my life to changing the course of the thinking of the government. And of course, Carol and Stevens Van Strum gave far more than I can even explain to you here and she is, she is still at it. So my favorite moment in court uh, was the progeny, and we took what we learned in Katz versus Berglund, and we applied it in ONC versus Goonsman. And Carl was involved in helping in that case. And in Oregon Environmental Council versus Goonsman, it's the same thing. The government is early broadcast spraying chemicals and saying it's not harmful. When it is harmful, these chemicals carve over to kill the gypsy moth and they're spraying these large tracks of area, and they literally would have these little teeny traps, little triangular traps, and they would go around, and would finally find, oh, they found a moth in one of the traps, oh my God, and so now the government comes in and pays the state of Oregon to early broadcast spray these huge areas, and of course, to kill the gypsy moth. Of course, the gypsy moth is sort of related to butterflies, and, uh, and so the butterflies were also being poisoned, and so were the uh, uh, creatures that uh, ate the butterfly larvae. And so we're in court again, it's the same old thing, the government is saying it's safe, it's not safe, and they, and thanks again to Mary O'Brien and to Carol and to Ruth Shear and to Stevens Van Strum and these other people, the government having lost enough times and having been bruised enough and not wanting to get really bruised again came up with a worst case analysis document. Except the worst case analysis document was so complicated and so long and so scientific and so based upon data that nobody in the world could understand it literally. And, and, and this, these documents are supposed to be passed out to decision makers. Here, read the worst case analysis. It wasn't one or two pages, it was three or four hundred pages. And so we're in court, we're in Judge Redden's court, my favorite moment, my favorite moment. We're in Judge Redden's court and they're putting on their case and they put on the chairman of the Department of 
of, of physics or some science, bioscience from Harvard. They get them all these degrees. They have an entire courtroom full of all these scientists they brought in and were all paying for. And he goes on and on and on about the worst case analysis. And they explain it, explain, explain, blah, 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 blah. And so, and Loretta says, okay, okay, I think I can stand it. So we get to ask a few questions. So I stopped and I asked one question. I said, you got the document, doctor? He says, yes. He said, just show Judge Redden in the document where it says how many people will be killed by this program. Just show the judge. Just find it. Because Mary O'Brien had told me, it's not in there. <laughs> I wouldn't ask a question. I didn't have some idea what the answer was. <laughs> I so trusted her. And so um, he's up there, and he starts to leaf through the document, and he realizes he can't understand an effing thing about what's in the document, even though he wrote it and signed it. So he finally looks out in the audience, and he says to the audience, he says, that any of you out there, can you help me? And now the judge looks over at him and says, uh, Professor, th this is your question. And, and then so finally he, re he, re he re regroups, not. He says, if I were in my labs, plural, not just one lab, if I were in my labs with my computers, I think I could make the necessary calculations. <laughs> that was it. I sat my fat ass down. And when the judge wrote his opinion, when the judge wrote his opinion, he quoted that answer to show that the worst case analysis was no good. He enjoined it, made the front page of the New York Times. My mother read it. She wrote me a letter. She says, when you, you, uh, you know, tell Judge Redden you're sorry and you'll never do anything bad in this courtroom again. And I show the letter to the judge. And my mom's 93. I'm probably going to see her on Friday. Anyway, that's it. One more thing. Um, the, uh, the battle really is not anything like over, even I'm on the sidelines, but I'll tell you one last short, very sad thing that I will try not to cry when I'm telling you. One week ago today, at this hour actually, and uh, the hour that followed it, I spent, I was uh, back holding a hand of, um, I couldn't say he's my very best friend because he's only been a friend 20 years, but he's, um, was one of my closest and dearest friends. I loved him very much. He was a physician. He was an ER doctor. He was a middle class marathon runner and bicyclist. He has saved innumerable lives doing his work in the emergency department and training other people to do emergency work and training people in the fire departments and in the emergency part, uh, department to do this work. And uh, he saved innumerable lives. And I, I held his hand. I left. And I uh, got home, and uh, his wife gone, he died. He died of multiple myeloma. He died of, of, of cancer of the bone marrow. I had been telling him for a long time that I thought the cause of his cancer was riding his bicycle through his uh, country roads. He's surrounded, he's surrounded by filbert orchards. And the filbert orchards are being sprayed for all sorts of things all of the time constantly spraying herbicides, pesticides, and uh, he would inhale these, and he would touch them, and they would cover his body. And he did this for years, and I believe he had a toxically induced cancer that took his life. Could I prove it in the courtroom? Well, I'd give it a good shot if I had the chance. Last thing I'll say is, these things are not, bi these things are not pesticides, insecticides, rodenticides, um, herbicides. They're all the same thing. They're all the same thing. They're biocides. They are meant to kill life. And take your lives and measure your lives against the women up here and the others who have, have come since them and the changes that these people have made in the world and uh, you will be able to f live a fulfilled life. The case that I, cases that I had for them have been over 40 years. I have had hundreds of trials, several hundred jury trials. I've had some real luck in court. Well, all the cases that I've had my whole life, all the cases have had some wins that have been pretty good. There's never been a better experience in my life as I look back on, on it than working with these people and the success they achieved in these cases. So having just heard Larry Sobel, you, I, I need to tell you, with just what he did right now, I need to tell you a quick story from the trial. He's supposed to be questioning people. He's supposed to be eliciting testimony. He starts getting wound up. He's 
each drawing drawings on a piece of paper uh, that's uh, up and the other the attorney on the other side objects to the judge he says this guy is supposed to be the attorney he's testifying the judge says let him alone he's on a roll <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Yes, thank you. Many rolls ahead. <laughs> Our fourth speaker is Ruth Shear, and Ruth has been an expert witness as a scientist in many, many toxic cases, um, including the trials that we've been talking about today. Um, Ruth has a delightful book that you may want to pick up. Um, it's, it chronicles her experience uh, working with activists, citizen groups, on toxic uh, trials. And uh, it's called Adventures in Seeking Environmental Justice in the 1980s. I highly recommend it. Please welcome Ruth Shearer. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really glad to be here. Um, I'm going to um, broaden out beyond just the forestry, forestry business because I've been uh, testifying in trials for a whole lot of other things ever since. Well, I was deeply involved in laboratory research on the molecular mechanisms of how chemicals cause cancer. I met many friends through environmental networks in Oregon and Washington. Two of these friends served on an advisory group to Seattle Metro and Water Quality Division. They convinced the committee that Metro should not make a decision to dump herbicides in local lakes to kill Eurasian milfoil until they determined the potential adverse effects to people and to the aquatic environment. Then they recommended me to perform the study on human health effects of the four herbicides which were available for the control of aquatic vegetation, and one of them was 2,4-D. Little did I know that my metro contract would result in a career change for me. After the report was published and circulated free by metro, I began to get calls from all over the country wanting me to search out and evaluate the results and quality of testing done on various chemicals, mostly pesticides. Since pressure from the chemical companies was making it hard to get funding, funding for the study of how chemicals cause cancer by that time, I decided to quit my research and become a consultant instead. The consulting business was very satisfying as the people I served were so thankful for my help. I worked for citizens groups like NCAP, native tribes, labor unions, small governments, and individuals threatened or already injured by toxic chemicals. Science is a search for truth, not a search for ways of supporting one's biases. A scientist's conclusion must consider all of the relevant data and cannot selectively ignore part of it. This is in contrast to the way a court of law operates. Lawyers, <laughs> 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 may differ with me. This is how I see the situation. A lawsuit seeks to determine justice between two opposing parties. An expert witness must be called by one of the parties and therefore cannot testify without seeming to take sides. This fact makes many academic and laboratory scientists uncomfortable and often unwilling to testify in court or in an adversarial administrative hearing. There are three basic types of toxic chemical cases. Community appeals, which are for the prevention of poisoning. Citizen action, that's obstruction of projects leading to poisoning. And personal injury or product liability suits, compensation for damages for poisoning. I received many calls from attorneys, victims, groups of citizens, and occasional medical doctor, not very many, 
and uh, the press. The calls came from all over the United States and a few foreign countries. They got my name by word of mouth or because of the study on herbicides I'd done for Seattle Metro. There was never a need to advertise my services. My assignment here today includes what insight can you provide into interactions between the scientific and activist communities? Well, I've kind of, I've kind of been talking about that. But that question leaves out an essential third leg of the process, the environmental law community. I want to include my interpretations of working with the legal community. More than half of the attorneys who called me had no prior experience with a toxic chemical case and little or no education in chemistry or physiology. However, they were generally avid seekers of such knowledge and easy to educate, in contrast to the doctors. <laughs> they worked very hard, even though the personal injury and product liability cases were usually on contingency. That was a big gamble when the offending corporations had gaggles of well-paid attorneys to defend them. My chief sources of information were Medline, Toxline, and other search programs of the National Library of Medicine and documents from the EPA, including their pesticide fact sheets. I used reviews only as leads to find the original research reports, but they seldom led to publicly available trustworthy data. Of the reviews, the least useful were environmental impact statements because of their inherent bias in favor of allowing the project and because they usually quoted e other EISs instead of research data. In injury lawsuits, usually the expert witness must be agree to be deposed by the opposing attorney as part of the discovery process. In the presence of plaintiff's attorney, defendant's attorney can ask any questions for as long as he chooses, so the witness must answer factually, if not extensively. Sometimes this is prolonged far beyond any reasonable length for getting the needed facts on the case. This is done to harass the witness and waste the plaintiff's money or the plaintiff's attorneys if the case is on contingency. One chemical company defense attorney who had previously been a biology professor kept me trapped for three days in a motel conference room, conducting the deposition like an oral exam for a PhD student. I could answer nearly all of his irrelevant questions and was rather enjoying the challenge, but plaintiff's attorney was getting more and more angry. She had to stay there and cancel all of her appointments at her office in Alabama and pay for four nights in the motel while I could go home and relax at night. One defense firm in Boston required me to come there for three depositions in three different months. There was no new information between these sessions. It was just another way to waste the plaintiff's attorney's money. They eventually settled for the illegal spraying of a lake while the victim was fishing in plain sight in the middle of the lake. That victim knew the law said you shut off your spray when you come over a body of water. So he went right to the middle of the lake with his canoe when he heard the airplanes coming and they sprayed right over him multiple passes without shutting off the spray. Nearly all the cases on which I worked were either attempts to prevent mass poisoning of a group of people or to get fair compensation for victims of poisoning. In these cases, I was always a witness for the plaintiffs. However, twice I was asked to testify for people who had illegally resisted a government-approved action that would have allowed unsafe exposure of themselves or others to burial spraying of herbicides. In those two cases, the people I was helping were the defendants. These latter cases allowed me to answer yes when industry lawyers asked whether I had ever testified for the defense. <laughs> <laughs> this was one protection against accusations of being a radical environmentalist. <laughs> Another occurred when a defense attorney asked me, Dr. Shearer, what is your principal source of support? I think he was expecting me to say something like NCAP and other such groups. And I answered honestly, a husband who works for the Boeing company. <laughs> In the 1980s, the prevailing opinion 
was that herbicides only harm plants, insecticides only harm insects, and so on. There were very few toxicology experts around, not in the chemical companies or their associates. Communities called me in to get the attention of governments or their agencies which were not protecting their citizens. I also talked to the press about threats to the health of community members, thus educating additional people by publicizing the problem and the failure of the government to take it seriously. No matter how knowledgeable and capable the local people are, the powerful are more likely to listen to someone brought in as an expert. An expert is only an expert at least 100 miles from home. <laughs> the real heroes in these situations were the community organizers who saw the problem and um, talked to their neighbors about what should be done. Then they would call me for documentation of the hazard which they could take to the agency to call attention to the problem. If they were still ignored, then they might ask me to come and testify in an appeal of government failure to protect them or a proposed government action which threatened them. Community organizers can be ad hoc, working only on a specific threat to their community or full-time on alert to respond to proposed threats. The latter, like NCAP, are, are funded by grants and donations from a wider area and maintain files of information to help small groups resolve their problems. Often their success relieved me of any need to be involved, but they also recommended me. This, uh, two of these were NCAP and the Washington Toxics Coalition in Seattle. Now the questions we were all given. What was especially challenging about that work? I would have to say funding. NCAP and other community organizers weren't always able to pay, pay me for my help with their activism for the benefit of others. I, I submitted a bill, Larry, but, well, it came with a good. Uh, Norma, where is that bill? I gave you that bill. <laughs> <laughs> Did the legal victories in forestry cases help with pesticide personal injury torts? I would have to say no to this, except for the situations in which blocking forest <coughs> spraying prevented pesticide injuries from happening. Uh, it, cases that are limited to enforcement of NEPA really don't carry over into personal injury towards. How is the current legal regulatory climate different from what it was in the 80s? Legislators and other people are not so gullible to the propaganda of the chemical purveyors now is much easier, at least in the Northwest, to pass laws protecting the public, and especially children, now. Uh, thank you, that's all I have to say. Yeah, and, um, Lauren, should we do something, because I know we're recording this. We're not gonna be able to hear the question. If you just wanna repeat the question. Okay, so please uh, keep shortly. it to questions, so I can repeat that, thank you. <laughs> I just wanna pay homage to these people. <laughs> I may not be able to talk. It's been uh, 30 years since I've seen most of them. I came to Goose Bay in 1973 as a civil culturist and had decided that I would make my own decisions and let the, the uh, institution I was working for input but not make my decisions. And so I wasn't going to spray herbicide because of my Vietnam experience. But I'd seen the landscape and the people of Vietnam I've done my own research. I believe it was carcinogenic, teratogenic, mutagenic. And I was really wondering if it was really good for the forest. And so I said, I won't spray if it costs me my job. And so they said, well, you gotta prove you don't need to spray. So uh, I decided that if I would need my engine rebuilt in the car, I should go and ask questions of someone who rebuilds engines. And so I said, where is, the, where is a forest that has been managed properly? And it turns out it was only the natural forest. So I said, we should duplicate the natural forest. It was here since the glaciers left. Sustained, rich environment, beautiful trees, water. I know this is not a question, but I just wanted to get this. Uh, and so I said, I don't think herbicides have a place in the natural forest. And we excluded fire. That was a great change agent. And so with Greenside Up and the Reforestation Co-op, these people, a lot of these people were in Don Striders, a Reforestation Co-op out of Nesquin. And Don Striders came to me and they said, we'll help you design a study. And so we designed a study of 
alder in Douglas Spur plantations and discovered that the alder was not affecting the Douglas Spur at all. As a matter of fact, it was growing better in the alder and coming through the alder canopy. And so thanks to Greenside Up, I don't know if anybody still exists from that organization. I do, thank you. Greenside Here, Up, thank yes, you. Yes, I haven't been here since Jerry Spence spoke. But <laughs> oh my goodness. And we, and it so, was pretty active times. So I just want to um, thank you for sharing your story. And I just want to encourage everyone to come to our reception this evening where we can share more stories and thank each other in, in person more. So. so my question is not really to this group. My question okay. is to the university and to industry. It was so easy for me to get information. There was a study in the 30s about conifer and alder plantations together grew more conifer volume than pure conifer plantations. My question is to people, young people here, and to the industry and to the university, why didn't you look at the facts, the biological facts, instead of going the emotional route? All right, thank you. I'll just make one little response which was a couple of years ago the Forest Service. Do you want to get to the... Um, oh, a couple phone? of years ago the Forest Service was approaching people out where we live asking for alder seedlings because they were desperate to replant alder among their Douglas fir where they had killed all the alder. Because it turns out that alder roots prevent a fungus that kills Douglas fir. Mm -hmm. And they need each other. So... Mm -hmm. We've come a long way. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna come over here and uh, the woman in the blue. Thank you. We'll go back and forth on sides. Yeah. Uh, I've been working with the people in Triangle Lake, and you know they're not dealing with the Forest Service, and they're not dealing with BLM, who is doing a much better job as a conservation person mm -hmm. with the Butterfly Association, which may sound kind of strange. I comment on forest policy. So I have this giant book about the, the environmental assessment that they've done most recently. And so I try to give that information to the people. And um, there's this, you know, an investigation that right now going on on the state level. But it's dealing with the private timber industries. And they're not really limited in any way. 24D is one of the main things that they're tracking there. And I'm, I picked up some interesting information from you today about having more research that information. Maybe some of you people are still available to give information to the community. I feel like the, 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 the people at the state level currently have decided that instead of retesting the people from trying to lake as they promised to do, they're going to take a whole new area, which is related, but not the same people at all. They're not doing what they said they're going to do. As far as I can tell, there's not many people in that area. It's what I would call an end run around this investigation. And yeah. I think these people really need some help. My question is, is somebody available to help with some of these kinds of questions over there at Triangle Lake? What are they? There's some a, there's of us have already been working with them. I mean, okay. the, the whole question of 240 is so full of scandal and cover-up and has been for 35 years. It's, it's banned in Europe. As well, 240, try to get information about the dioxins in 240. They are just as bad as 245T. However, I spent four years trying to, under the Freedom of Information Act, and I finally got four big boxes of paper from EPA, and it was all blank. With a stamp on each one saying confidential business information. Oh, God. So the chemical companies refuse, they're required by EPA since 1990, they've been required to test their products for all dioxins, not just. And they're submitting that information, and it's all being kept secret. And there's only one reason it would be secret, in my opinion. I did get documents leaked out of EPA, and I sent it to the Triangle Lake folks, showing that one quarter of the samples contain rather high levels of not only 2378 PCP, but a whole range of other Dioxins. They're not actually giving out the results of their testing. You have to wait till summer to even comment on this. Uh, 
you can get a whole lot more information actually right off the internet on chemicals and you also besides published literature that might appear there uh, too far deep of course there's boxes and boxes of studies done over many many years but the peer-reviewed ones are good and the uh, government Government often documents often are very useful. That depends which administration they were published during. And uh, EPA pesticide fact sheets. If you can get that or get the wrote, EPA REG. I, I wrote down what you said. Does it, yeah. Does it give you the men mindset? When they're fact sheet. when they're evaluating pesticides for re-registration, they put publish a yeah. the REG. Re-registration, something or other, evaluation document, something like that anyway, which should tell you what studies are still inadequate, what still needs to be done, what isn't known about the chemical. But if I haven't, I haven't done it myself recently, but I start out by going through the internet and see what you can get. And then remember the, the source. Be careful about any kinds of reviews or any chemical company information. Okay, thank you. So I was at a, um, I'm Amy Pinkus Merwin, I'm a uh, property owner in Deadwood and I was affected by Agent Orange, I'm a victim of the Agent, or survivor of the Agent Orange Wars, as I call them. I'm a 10-year breast cancer survivor. I do a lot of work on anti-herbicide. I'm also working with the Toronto Lake uh, test studies. They're now moved it from Toronto Lake to Monroe, Cheshire, um, Elmira, and Junction City, which none of which is forested area. So it's very <laughs> unlikely it's all agriculture or um, vineyards or lots and lots of tree farms, lots of toxics there. Um, big toxic depot right across from Monroe High School. Uh, but I went to an OFRI um, meeting, which is about the opposite of this, on Tuesday at OSU, um, the Oregon Forest Research Institute meeting. And, Mike Newton spoke. I've never had a chance to talk to him before, so I thought I would take advantage of it there. And um, um, they didn't let me speak, but I'm pretty loud, so I overrode them. And um, right before lunch, you know, I said, I think you got two minutes for me, because they were trying to shut me down. And I stood up and I said, um, Professor Newton, I want to acknowledge you as the godfather of forestry pesticides. And I enrolled a scroll, which is an anecdotal epidemiology I put together of all the people from the Deadwood, Five Rivers, and all the area that I know, just that I know, that have illnesses or have died or uh, birth defects or et cetera. And I said, you know, I believe you're responsible for the illnesses and the deaths of all these people, and I believe you should be indicted in the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity. And it was stop shining. Sure. Sure. I'm going to get there. I just want to respect other people's time too. Because sure. Can. A lot of people. So we're calling on uh, Governor Kitzhaber right now to place a moratorium on forestry uh, pesticides because of the results showing up in Triangle Lake through Dr. Dana Barr's study, uh, study as well as the flawed, very flawed Oregon Health Authority study. And um, you know, I'd like to work with Mr. Scoble and others up here to uh, pursue providing more and more evidence to the media and to his office. Um, I'm wondering if you'll help us, please and how you'll help us, how we can brainstorm together all this excellent energy from 30 years ago because it's still going on and people are getting sick from it today and children are getting sick from it today. It hasn't abated at all. And they, okay. the, the state so the top, the top state toxicologists, the top state toxicologists are denying that there's any dioxin continuing being sprayed in industrial force. I have a video. Anything filed? Any lawsuit filed? Not yet. We're beginning to work. We have an attorney though. Be happy to talk with you about it. Okay, let's take uh, another question, John. I just wanted to say a couple things. First of all, I decided to come in a disguise today. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I just want to say a, a, a couple quick stories about my, my friends uh, and to encourage law students and actors to realize what treasures we have sitting here, here, and, and many other places around the room. Um, I love Mary O'Brien in one of our uh, pesticide cases uh, in which uh, at the break, uh, the judge uh, said, we'll take a recess, and then the clerk came up and said, do you know that woman 
the row behind you? I said, yes, it's Dr. O'Brien. Uh, could I talk to her? I said, sure. I had her come up to the bar, and, and the clerk of the court said, uh, the judge has noticed that you don't stand when she comes into the courtroom. <laughs> and Mary said, well, yeah, I can't. The clerk said, oh, I'm sorry, but I can't. What do you mean? Uh, I'm Quaker, and we cannot stand before authority. And the clerk said, okay. She went back out, and then before the judge came in, she said, could you ask uh, Dr. O'Brien to come forward? The judge understands. She wonders whether you would mind sitting in the last row. <laughs> <laughs> now, Larry Sokol here, who is uh, hell on wheels as a lawyer, he donates time when he, uh, when he can. He also uh, holds people to account. Um, I recall that when he, uh, after starting to practice law here, he won, won the first million dollar tort verdict in Oregon history. And he called up his professor back east, Arnold Reitze, and said, Professor Reitze, you remember me? I'm Larry Sokol. Oh, yeah, Larry, I remember you. Uh, Arnold, do you remember that C you gave me in torts? <laughs> I just won the first million dollar verdict in Oregon history. <laughs> and Arnold writes, he replied, Larry, you still deserve the C. <laughs> Carol Van Strum, so many stories, but I just want to honor you again for, first of all, the incredible impact, not just your activism, but your book, The Bitter Fog. Uh, uh, I started reading A Bitter Fog, and as I was reading, I was thinking, either this is the greatest writer in this area since Rachel Carson, or she's crazy. And I, I, I wasn't sure which, because she's talking about the government coming out and taking samples from her refrigerator of a chicken with two heads, taking other kinds of samples, uh, fetal samples and so forth, and going away and never hearing again. And I thought, yeah, come on. I mean, I used to work for EPA. I mean, they don't just do that, right? So I'm reading this book at a conference in Colorado. I'm reading that chapter. And I noticed that she said that the people that took the samples from Colorado State University, I was at the University of Colorado, this is an easy phone call. Even in those days, it cost a little more money. I called Colorado State. And I said, excuse me, do you know anything about, I called this particular, I think it was Nelson. Really? Yeah. Uh, anything about this? And the person said, uh, well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> And my stomach kind of dropped out. I thought, well, she's not crazy. She's the greatest writer since Rachel Carson. Uh, I said, what do you know about this? Uh, oh, well, those samples? Yeah, well, we sent them down to the EPA lab in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. I said, oh, well. So I called Mike Axline, who's back here, because I had to go back into the conference meeting, and he called up in Bay St. Louis. Oh, we sent the samples up to Dr. Nelson Gross, the University of Nebraska. Mike called him. And then Mike, being a law professor, which uh, sounds like a professor, uh, if you say it in a hurry, they might not hear the word law. said, hi, Dr. Gross. Uh, this is Professor Ike Axon of the University of Oregon School of Law. Uh, <laughs> and I understand this. And, and, and you could hear in the background these papers rustling. He asked about the question and said, I think the samples must be here. I don't know. I remember that study. Let me see. Rustling papers. Oh, here. Uh, oh, my God. Didn't EPA do anything about this? It was two days later, I believe, the helicopters landed in your yard, the national news organizations exposing dioxin found uh, in these samples. Later proved out to be a mistake. It, instead, it was downstream from the Monsanto chemical plant. They had other studies. They had multiple studies from LC, from Monsanto. And then she got the whole idea of dioxin in paper products, wrote a report for Greenpeace, led in part to the creation of the Environmental Law Alliance worldwide. So all those stories, I may get some of them wrong, but the person is right, and thank you so much. I, I, can't, I can't listen to all of this from you without saying two things. <laughs> First of all, did I ever dream when I realized I didn't know anything about environmental law would need somebody who did? Did I ever dream that I would bring into the cases the brightest, most capable, hardest working environmental lawyer in the country, and what was he doing in Eugene? And 
I didn't dream it, and he is that person. And the benefit of that is that in, you have to have something to say when you're talking to a federal judge, other than blah, 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 blah. And he knew the cases, National Sea Clamors was one of my favorites, yep. and all of these other precedents, and he did his best to try to explain it to the mouthpiece for about 30 seconds until he realized that he didn't need another mouthpiece. And the rest of the many years of litigation was spent uh, among ourselves negotiating as to who would do the talking with the court. <laughs> and it was not an easy negotiation. <laughs> and the last thing is this, the last thing is this, which is maybe the most important. There's no person in the entire nation, in my opinion, who has done more for the environment in terms of educating, in litigating, in supporting, in unleashing decades of environmental lawyers and the person sitting here designed in that very stunning blue, gray blue suit. <laughs> the tie, the tie, no. <laughs>